in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to our Bible class. Last uh, Tuesday, we were able to finish one chapter, that is chapter 6, though we were hoping we could finish 6 and 7. Today, let us continue to hope and wish to be able to finish two chapters, 7 and 8. 7 and 8 don't really have a lot of things to be interpreted. A lot of them are very literal. But just to review, of course, what we have discussed in chapter 6, of course, remember this. Of course, when Dawa is the 10th generation, now we are gotten into the 11th generation, which is, of course, the sons of Noah, Shem, and Japheth. And remember, we were talking about the sons of heaven. When the chapter 6 mentions the phrase sons of heaven, there are possible different interpretations. Some would interpret it as literally there were angels who came down from heaven. Okay? But most of the Bible scholars would interpret them to refer to, when we say sons of heaven, it refers to the good line, which is the line of Seth. Okay? Now there's also a mention of daughters of man. Okay? And of course, it is interpreted to be the daughters of man refers to the evil line. Now remember that they are Hebrews, they are patriarchal, that's why the men will always be the good guys, okay? The men cannot be the bad guys, okay? That is just something that is given. And of course, we are told in chapter 6 that the sons of heaven, that is a good line, intermarried with the daughters of man, which is the evil line. Therefore, if there is a intermarriage between the good line and the evil line, therefore everything or everyone will become evil. Negative plus positive in electricity, it will be fire. Okay? That's why because of that, because there is an intermarriage between the good line and the evil line, and everybody became evil, God said in verse 6, My spirit shall not remain in man. That should remind you of something, right? How was man created? The breath of God. Took the clay, make the form of the body, and then breathe into his nostrils. Therefore, for God to say, My spirit shall not remain in man, is not about God. Then, okay? Because our life comes from God by the breath of God. That's why when he says, My spirit shall not remain in man, in fact, he continues by saying, Their day shall not comprise 100, shall comprise 120 days. And remember, we talk about how do we interpret by the Bible telling us their life shall not comprise, shall comprise 120 years, rather. Sorry, not days. 120 years. How do we interpret that? It cannot be lifespan. That's one way of interpreting it. It can be the lifespan father. That means man can live only up to 120. But we said we cannot interpret it that way. What's the reason? Why can we not interpret it that way? Because there are some people who would live, okay, after this chapter, who would live after the flood, who would live beyond 120. So if we interpret this to be, oh, when God says their day shall not comprise 120 years, it should be interpreted like span, therefore nobody should live beyond 120. Ready for me? But we have people after the flood who live beyond 120. Good example is Abraham. How old was Abraham when he died? 175. How old was Jacob when he died? 147, we get into those stories. So their lifespan are beyond 120 years. So how do we interpret it then? How do we interpret it then? If it cannot be lifespan, length of life, therefore we are interpreting it as the time of the flood. Everybody? So from that time on, come 120 years, and it will be the flood. It will be the death except of course the eight human beings who will be inside that the ark are you following me that's why you can hear commentators say that how how long was the ark created or built the bible doesn't say okay? the bible doesn't say it only gives us the dimensions okay but it doesn't say how long did it take 
know what to build the ark. Remember how big the ark is. Okay? They would say, since it is 120 years, okay, notice that when the flood will happen, Noah was already 600 years old. Okay? So they said, it must be, the Bible tells us that the three sons will be born when Noah was already 500, 500 years old. And then from the time of 120, that's why they say, Noah must have built the ark for 100 years at least. But that's just, the Bible doesn't really tell us. Okay? But that's how some people would say, he must have built the ark for 100 at least years. Now, think about that. Who will be building the ark? Just them, huh? Just Noah. And hopefully the three sons. And the three daughters did know because everybody else did not believe him. That's why it will only be the eight of them who will be building the ark. And of course, we know how big the ark is. Okay? And he said that because of that, he, God said, not desire that man's heart, okay, that his heart could see was never anything but evil. And then I told you what do we call this again? That everything that we desire, we always have the inclination to do evil. What's that? Concupiscence. Man's tendency to do evil. We always have the tendency to do evil. Before this, we have what we call us? Original justice, original holiness. Remember, I was explaining that to you. Our intellect, three things. We have intellect, we have will, and we have passion. Our intellect, when the intellect says this is good, What's the, what's the reaction of the will? To do it. You want it. You, you should want it. Okay? Passion, you will do it. Okay? The other way around, will, say, uh, intellect says, it is evil. What should be the reaction of the will? I don't like it. Okay? What will be the reaction of passion? I will not do it. You call that as original holiness or original justice. When Adam and Eve were created, they functioned that way. Okay? They functioned that way. Intellect. I think it's still here. <laughs> Intellect. Will. And passion. Okay? They functioned harmoniously, perfectly. Okay? Perfectly harmonious. When the intellect says it is good, the way it automatically says, I like it. The passion it automatically does it. When the intellect says, it's bad or evil, the will automatically doesn't like it and the passion will not do it. Okay, you call that as original justice or original holiness. But when Adam and Eve sin, they destroyed this. Okay? Now what we have is concupiscence. Man's tendency to do evil. Now, even though the intellect says it is good, uh, I don't like it. Okay? I will not do it. Nowadays, even though the intellect says it is bad, hey, even though it's bad, I will like it. And I will do it. Just look at yourself. Even the sins that we commit, the bad things that we do, even before committing them, we already know they are bad. And yet we continuously do. We call that as concupiscence. I don't know, Father. I really want to stop this addiction to include whatever that addiction you have. But for some reasons, I love doing it. Okay? We call that as concupiscence. Thank Adam and Eve for that. <laughs> that's the first thing that we inherited from them. And by the way, that's also what our children or your children inherited from you. Down the line, that's why we call it original sin. Okay? And then another thing that we mentioned in chapter 6, God regretted. It's inconceivable that God can regret. Why is it inconceivable that God can regret? Why do you think? Because when you say he regretted, what does it imply? He made a mistake. He committed a mistake. Can he not commit a mistake? No. No. Because if he commits a mistake, what happens? He's not perfect anymore. Therefore, he cannot be blind. That's why the, the focus 
also of chapter 6 when it says, God regretted. It is more of God saddened by the turn of events. Okay, the turn of events. Okay, we also mentioned about Noah walking with God, and it means he's a good man. Remember, I was explaining to you, right? Choose. Chapter 6 would always say, Noah was a righteous man, which means to be righteous. Don't think of righteous as, as we are thinking of. He's a very good man. Okay? Doesn't commit anything bad. But to be righteous means obedient to the law. Obedient to the commandment of God. Remember that the law is the expression of the will of God for them. That's why to be obedient to the will of God, just follow the law. And no one was found to be a righteous man. Okay, remember I was explaining to you Joseph being a righteous man. Okay, obedient to God. Compared to the people during the time, the book of Genesis would tell, tell them, tell us, there was lawlessness. Okay. Then we found a person, three sons in chapter 6. Okay, the ark, what is made of? Government. What's the dimension? What's the length? 300 cubits. What's the weight? 50 cubits. What's the height? 30 cubits. What is a cubit, Father? A cubit is equivalent to 1.5 feet. Okay? Therefore, if the length is 300 cubits, so how long in feet is the arc? 450. How wide? 75. How high? 45. Can you imagine how big that is? How big the ark? And only eight of them will build the ark. No one thing will take the man who hears it. Those who are, are interpreting that way that they have built the ark for at least 100 years. It's true. Okay? But as I said, it's not really said in the Bible that they built it for 100 years. All we have, the Bible telling us that no one was 500 years old when the three sons were born. Okay? And then when the three sons were born, God said, I regret that. I will erase everything. From this time on, their days shall be only 120 years. If we count 160, 620 years old, actually, but the Bible tells us 600 years old when he was, when the flood was there. Okay? The three decks of the ark, this is of course the Okay, how many animals in the ark? How many animals? At least in chapter 6. Chapter 6 tells us that a pair of every kind. A pair of every animal and bird. Okay? But as already shown in my slide, there will be two versions. The next version we can find in chapter 7. Okay. I believe we studied that in CCT, right? They are always called Noah brought a pair of every animal in the ark. Everybody knows that. Let's go to chapter 7. <laughs> then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your household, for you alone in this generation have I found to be righteous. Everybody else is not obeying the Lord. It's not obeying the will of God. Only you, Noah, is found to be righteous before God. In fact, the Bible also this slide has another description of Noah. He's not only righteous, he's also blameless in that generation. That means he's righteous before God and he is good to everybody. Okay? Then God said, Of every clean animal here, take okay, the second version, notice, take with you seven pairs. A male and its mate, and of the unclean animals, one pair, a male and its mate. Likewise, every bird of, of the air, seven pairs, a male and a female, to keep their progeny alive over all the earth. For seven days from now, I will bring rain right, right, right down on the earth for forty days and forty nights. Okay? So there are the versions. The first version says, a pair of every animal and bird. The second version, you, you see it in the chapter 7. It says, seven pairs of the unclean, of the clean animals and birds. 
and a pair of unclean birds and animals. Now, of course, we'll find later on why, why all of a sudden there's a, a difference. Huh? Why a difference in two versions. Remember that in the book of Genesis, there are different traditions, sources of the stories. Okay? So, when we get into the second version, which is seven pairs of the clean animals and birds, Bible scholars would say that this must have been coming from what we call it as the priestly tradition. Why? Because again, fast forward. What will no one do immediately after the flood? The first thing that we will do? Sacrifice. Offer sacrifice. What do you use as animals for sacrifice? What kind of animals? Clean animals and clean birds. Therefore, if no one will only bring a pair of every kind of animal, what happens under the flood? Remember, the purpose is the way is to bring a pair. What's the purpose of that? For them to propagate, right? To continue. Remember that the big flood is like second creation story, another creation story. Huh? Remember that in the creation story, when you get to the first, second, third, remember that all the living creatures, all of the creation, everything that is living, God will put in it, build in its capacity to reproduce. That's why the plants, remember when the plants were created? God said, with its seed in it, so that it can continue. With the animals, when they were created, in the book of Genesis, it says, be fertile and multiply. It's not only for the human beings, huh? And then for the human beings also. So when God created all the living creatures, in it is the capacity to reproduce. Can you imagine if God, when he created human beings, there's no capacity to reproduce? Or for the animals, what do you think will happen? Huh? It's a non-stop creation. Okay. Okay. It's a non-stop creation. When the animals are already dead, okay, you'll be going to that blood. No more pigs. <laughs> nothing to eat, nothing to eat. God will have to pay again. But no, when he created all of those that have life, plants, animals, and human beings, built into it is the capacity to reproduce. Okay? That's why here, for the priestly version of the story, they could seek seven pairs of clean animals and clean birds. Because they are already thinking that after the flood, no one will offer a sacrifice. And of course, to offer a sacrifice, you need clean animals and clean birds. If he gets the clean animals and clean birds, then they will disappear. They will disappear. Now the question perhaps you have is, so what are the clean animals, father, and unclean animals? I'm sure that will be your next question, right? If you want to have a list based on the Old Testament, at least in the Old Testament, okay? But you know, this is a little gray area when you go into the clean animals at this point. Because the earliest record we have that there is such a thing as clean and unclean animals, you can find that in the book of Leviticus. You go to the book of Leviticus chapter 11, you will see all of the list of those that can be eaten and cannot be eaten. Let's not go into that. That's very complicated. <laughs> Just go to chapter 11 and you'll find. But that's all the Old Testament, huh? Remember that we are New Testament people, huh? Remember that the New Testament perfects the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, there will be a lot of prohibitions. You cannot eat this, you cannot eat that, you cannot eat this, you cannot eat that. Which we eat now. <laughs> but we say, oh, Father, we're not married this thing. It says to the because we should not eat this. Fast forward to, the, to our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Testament, what did he say? Not what comes to you defiles you, but what comes out of you defiles you. 
Sometimes it's difficult to understand, right, right? Because it's common sense. When you eat something that is unclean, you eat it, it becomes part of you, then you become unclean, right? But what comes out of me, Father, how does that define me? It already comes from me. Because we are only thinking of physical cleanness and uncleanness. When you eat something unclean, whatever that is in unclean like not, uh, what do you call that? not hygienic or whatever, you eat that, you become sick and what, right? You become unclean. But that's physical. But what is more important for the Lord is the spiritual cleanness. What do I mean by that? How do you judge a person, whether a person is good or bad? The actions. Okay? Why do you judge the action? Because whatever you do outside comes from within. Are you following me? Yes. Whatever you do outside comes from within. If you have a good heart, what do you expect of the person to do? If that person has a good heart, do you expect him to do evil things? What do you expect him to do? Good things. If the person has an evil heart, what actions do you expect from him? Therefore, what defines you is what comes from within. No matter what you eat, if you're a good person, you're good. <laughs> Not just because you eat uh, pork, you're already bad. There are a lot of good people who eat pork, huh? but there are also a lot of bad people who don't, don't eat pork. So it's not what you eat that makes you good or bad. It is what comes from within. Because for the Lord, that is, the Lord is more of the intention, which is actually the heart. That's why the Lord says, I know you have heard, you shall not kill. What did the Lord say? But I Anybody who has anger has to, what did he say? It's more of intention. If you have even an evil heart, you have already committed murder. Because everything that we do outside comes from within. Have I mentioned to you how John Paul II, as philosopher, defines man? How, how did he define man? John Paul II, remember our Pope, is a philosopher. He's, he defines man as the acting person. Man for him is the acting person. Because for John Paul II, as a philosopher, you judge the person by his action. And I would like to believe, I have not really read really deeply into the philosophy of John Paul II, but I, I would like to believe that this has some connection that of what comes from within the fantasy. Because for him, he says, you can judge the person by his actions, and his actions point to what's within. Have you heard this from uh, in my life as a teaching since I was ordained? Believe it or not, there are some students who would tell you, Oh, Father, you know, I'm really good. I, I'm just doing those bad things, but I'm really good. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever met a person like that? He says, Oh, but I'm really good, Father. And, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm just doing that, but I'm just actually good. <laughs> How can you be the person to say that he's good when he's doing bad things outside? Because all the actions that you do outside, comes from the okay. That's why for Jesus, the more important really is the within. If you have a good heart, everything becomes good. Okay? So, we, had, we said that because we're talking of clean and unclean animals. You want to have good, it's great area because the because will be later. So, we don't have yet a list here. 
of what he is. But if you're looking at that and then fast forward to Jesus Christ, he said, whatever comes from you is from you. That's what he finds. For seven days from now, I will bring rain down on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And so I will wipe out from the face of the earth every, every being that I have made. The one who applied, of course, being a righteous man, to be gentle the law, just as the Lord had commanded. Noah was 600 years old when the flood came upon the earth. Okay? Where does it say that Noah was 500? I believe in chapter 10, page 21, the very last uh, verse of chapter 5. It says, when Noah was 500 years old, he became Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Did you find that? And then in chapter 6, it says, Sir, so 120 years. That's why, as I said, that's the basis of some commentators who are saying, Oh, Noah built the ark for 120 years. Okay, but the Bible doesn't really tell us. Together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, Noah went into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of the clean animals and the unclean, of the birds and of everything that grows on the ground. Two by two, male and female came to Noah in the ark. Into the ark. Beautiful, right? Came to Noah. Remember we talked about that? We were saying like, what the hell did Noah gather the animals? When God told him, a pair you should bring to the does he go to everywhere and collect animals? Now I have a pair of giraffes already. <laughs> now I have a... But the Bible says, they will come to you. That's why here again, two by two male and female came to Noah into the ark, just as God has commanded him. When the seven days were over, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great abyss burst forth, and the floodgates of the sky were opened. So think about that. It's not just rain, huh? The source of the great flood is not just rain. You're only thinking of 40 days and 40 nights of rain, but it says here, all the fountains of the great abyss burst forth. So all sources of water. Okay. And notice the wording again. Flood gates. What does that remind you? <laughs> creation. Very good. Remember the creation. What day was that? What day of creation? Second day. Remember when there will be a dome. On the first day it light. Second day it dome. And the dome will have the floodgates. Again, going back to the concept of the rain. Okay? It's only possible with the dome, and the dome has floodgates. Without that, during the time, it's difficult to conceive of rain. For 40 days and 40 nights, hail heavy rain poured down on the earth. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of Noah's sons had entered the ark. Together with every kind of wild animal, every kind of same animal, every kind of crawling thing that crawls on the earth, and every kind of bird. Pairs of all pictures in which there was the breath of life came to Noah into the earth. It's, it's consistent, huh? The animals came to Noah. Those that entered were male and female. Of all pictures they came, as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. The flood continued upon the earth for 40 days. As the waters increased, they lifted the ark so that it rose above the earth. So if, if you are reading the if you are reading the story, it's kind of confusing how long really was the, the flood. Let me just So let's just say that no one created the not created, built the ark for 100 or 120 years. And when the ark was done, God gave them how many days to bring everybody in the ark? Seven days. Seven days. How 
did he do it in seven days to get everybody in? I don't know. <laughs> in seven days. And then after seven days, is there, there is an ark. Then we have 40 days and nights to rain. It's kind of very complicated. Huh? I might be wrong, but try to try to follow how the book of Genesis says. And then it says here, that's why it's a little confusing. Verse 17, the flood continued upon the earth for 40 days. As the waters increased, they lifted the ark. So what does it mean? Because when you say continued upon the earth, there was flood and the flood was 40 days, right? But it seems not, because later on we will see, we will be told that the flood was there for 150 days. So it's a little confusing. Okay? This is just me trying to make sense of how the book of Genesis says. So for me, I would say that it seems like after the 40 days, it continued to increase the flood for another 40 days. Again, this is just reading on your own, make your own analysis of how you will come with the days, okay, until it reaches its highest peak, and then the flood will remain for 150 days. Are you following? Yeah. But make your own calculation, go back to the book of Genesis, because it uses back and forth the same terminologies. It's a little confusing how to really interpret it literally. But again, remember I was telling you, not the details, it's the it's quite just time to make sense. So 100 years of building the ark, and then 7 days of getting everybody inside. After that, 40 days and 40 nights of rain. When it is 40 days, there will be an English water for another 40 days, and the flood will remain for 150 days. As the waters increase, they lifted the ark so that it rose above the earth. The waters swell and it is greatly on the earth, but the ark floated on the surface of the water. Higher and higher on the earth, the waters swelled until all the highest mountains under, under the heavens were submerged. The waters swelled 15 cubits. I hope it's here. Okay, 15 cubits higher than the highest of what they know, huh? Because now they travel the world, they don't during the day. Okay. So when they say highest peak, maybe that's what their basis of, they did not see anything. But how deep was the water? 15 cubits higher than the highest peak. Convert them into feet, how many? 22.5 feet. Whatever is the highest point of the earth, 22.5 feet, everything is submerged. The only thing you see is water and the earth. Can you imagine that? Water and the earth. So that's the message and the story that is the most important. We may argue about this years and days and everything. The point of the story is everything will be submerged. Which means everything will be destroyed. That's the point. Regardless of how long did he build it, how did he, does it really matter? Okay. So everything will be submerged, which is everything will be destroyed. Not even the fish. I remember my high school students also asked me, except the fish father, ask your science teacher. When all the waters are gathered together, everything will be polluted, even the fish will die. Nothing could do that. If all the waters will, it will be the polluted water. Nobody will survive. Yeah. All creatures that move on earth perish. Birds, they animals, wild animals, and all the things on the, on the earth, as well as all of humankind. Everything on dry land with the breath of life and is lost in the the Lord wiped out every being on earth. Human beings and animals, the crawling things and the birds of the air, all were wiped out from the earth. 
only Noah and those with him in the ark were left. So everything was really destroyed. I think the most important question really is, Father, did the big flood really happen? What did it? Did it literally happen? Was there really great flood? Well, there can be some scientific explanation that it really happened. Number one, if you have been researching, you will know that there are some universities who cannot explain until now why there are fossils found on tops of the mountain and everything like that. Fossils of sea creatures. That's why some scientists would say that the only possible way they can explain why they can they, they found sea creature fossils even on high mountains is the possibility that really there was the great part. And there are others. But one very important proof we have that it literally happened, go to the New Testament. The New Testament would refer to the Noah's Ark. No less than Jesus himself. What did Jesus say? As in the time of Noah shall be with the coming of the Son of Man. What does that mean? That even Jesus believed it happened. Because even Jesus used it okay, as in the time of Noah. But do you, where do you find that? In Matthew chapter 24 verses 37 to 39. Jesus says, as it was in the time of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Therefore, if you ask, did the big flood really happen? Yes, it literally happened. That's our start. Okay? Because even, and it's not only Jesus Christ, you go to the Old Testament, there will be other quotations of using the time of Noah. Let's go to chapter 8. And when the waters had swelled on the earth for 150 days, see? God remembered Noah. Now, don't think that he forgot Noah. Huh? God doesn't forget. What does it mean when the Bible says, God remembered Noah? That means he will already fulfill whatever he has promised. Okay? What he has what he has promised to Noah. What is the promise to Noah? Everything will be destroyed, and since you're the only one found to be righteous, when you begin with it. God remembered Noah and all the animals while they say that were with him in the ark. So God made the wind sweep over the earth, and the waters began to subside. The fountains of the abyss and the floodgates of the sky were closed. And the downpour from the sky was held down. Gradually, the waters receded from the earth at the end of 150 days. See? It's a little confusing. What, what does it mean that the flood continued for 40 days and now the flood is there for 150 days? That in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Aram. Okay? Now, by the way, another proof we have that the flood really happened. What do you notice in the story? Very specific with time. When did it happen? On the seventh month, on the tenth month, on the same day. Notice that? If it did not literally happen, can the writer even put the months and the days? But no, it's very specific. Mountains of Ararat. So where did it land? The mountains of Aram. No particular mountain. Huh? That's why it says mountains, that region of Aram. Okay. Now, of course, there are some historians who would say that they found the, the ark. Huh? There are different versions. But still, they are tracing it in the same region, which is somewhere in Iraq. Okay. The waters continue to diminish until the tenth month day of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains appeared. At the end of 40 days, 
see, here again, another 14 days. At the end of 14 days, Noah opened the hatch of the ark that he had made. Remember the one cubic, one point five feet open? And he released a raven, and it blew back and forth until the waters dried up from the earth. Can you imagine the raven? What's the role of the raven? Blew back and forth. Okay? It's like electric fun, huh? To try the earth. Blew back and forth until the waters dried up from the earth. Then he released a crowd to see if the waters had lessened on the earth. But the dog could not find no place to perch, and it returned to him in the ark. For there was water over on the earth. Putting out his hand, he caught the dog and threw it back to him inside the ark. He waited yet seven days more, seven days more, and again released the dog from the ark. In the evening, the dog came back to him, and there in his field was a plant of olive leaves. So no one knew that the waters had diminished on the earth. He waited again another seven days and then released the dog. But this time it did not come back. So how many how many times was the dog released? Three times. The first one to be released was Raven. Did it return? No, it flew back in court. Now another reason you think that Raven did not return, what do you think? Raven by nature, by their nature, they eat anything. Imagine all the animals and human beings dead. That raven must be feasting on all of those things. <laughs> okay. So first the raven, three bucket work to dry the earth, and then the dog was released, it came back, nothing that it can rest on. Second time the dog was sent, came back with that olive leaf. It's a sign, oh, there's already life, but still came back. That means it's not really, there's not really enough place for him to rest. The third time, never came back, which means, oh, he enjoyed it already. Therefore, it's already tried. Okay. In the six and first year, 601st year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the water began to dry up on the earth. Noah then removed the covering of the ark and saw that the surface of the ground had not dried. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth went dry. Can you imagine the writer putting really the dates, huh? One day, one month, one year. Therefore, it must really be literally true. Then God said to Noah, Go out of the ark together with your wife and your sons and your sons' wives. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you, all creatures, be they birds or animals or crawling things that crawl on the earth, and let them abound on the earth, and be fertile and multiply you. Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, and all the animals, all the birds, all the crawling creatures that crawl on the earth went out of the ark by families. Then no one built an altar to the Lord. And choosing from every clean animal and every clean bird. There you go. That's why the second version of the Christian tradition that he brought seven pairs of every clean animal and clean bird. Because after the blood, he will offer sacrifice, sacrifice of clean animals and birds. He offered bird offerings on the altar. When the Lord smelled the sweet odor, the Lord said to himself, Never again. Will I curse the ground because of human beings, since the desires of the human heart are evil from you? Again, concupiscence. Nor will I ever again strike out every living being as I have done. All the days of the earth, seed time and harvest, for the heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Okay, that's why it's like the second. It's another creation story. God will erase everything and begin anew with Noah and all of those that are with him in the ark. Okay? That's why you will notice that when you get into chapter 9, all the things that were promised to Adam and Eve in the first creation story will be given again to Noah. Okay? All of those promised to Adam and Eve will be given again to Noah. Why? It's take to 
It's okay. Big two again. Reset. Reset. Let's go back again. I'm the one. This is what you're going to do. As I have promised. Of course, you're going to mention as I have promised. I'm not going to say, no one. This is what you will have. This is what you will have. This is what you will have. Begin again with me. Amen? Amen. Any questions? Yes. No, if they were sent in order to check if the earth is already dry. Okay, so the raven flew back and forth until the earth dry. The first dog when released came back, which is a sign that he has nothing to rest on. Because if he has things to rest on, he will stay outside of the earth, but he came back. The second time he was released, he came back. That means there's not enough place to go or what? But he has with him an olive leaf. This means of oh, things are beginning to grow. Remember, of course there will be mountains, right? But some parts are still submerged. The third time, the dove never returned. Which means it's already back to the okay? That's why Noah will not go out of the Any other question? Okay, let us all stand. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the 